for those of you who don't know me, I'm Craig Brown, and I serve as one of the pastors here at First Free Methodist Church in Seattle. And I'm joined by some fantastic pastors who are newly minted at the annual conference on Friday. We had our ordination service, and we're very excited about that. Stephanie Simmons, who was up here earlier, was ordained an elder in the Free Methodist Church. And Camille Pook, who's sitting right here, you'll see her a little later, she was ordained an elder in the Free Methodist Church. Next Sunday, we will have a reception and celebration for all of those who were ordained. And yes, there will be cake. So I want you to come next week and join in that celebration as we recognize all those who have now entered uh, the ordained ministry and we celebrate Uh, this great moment in their lives and in the life of our church to have a pastoral team and staff that are just ready to serve and engage with each and every one of you. I grew up, if you don't know this already, in Southern California, very near the beach. And I used to go to the beach all the time, all the time. And so I got a lot of sun when I was young. And so you may have noticed I had a little uh, incision here on the side of my face because I had to have some skin cancer removed about a month ago. It was a little tiny thing, but yet it turned into a giant incision on the side of my face. So it's a constant reminder that I got too much sun when I was growing up. And when I used to go to the beach multiple times a week as a young person, a young adult, and even into adulthood, I learned how to body surf. Now, body surfing is different from surfing on a surfboard or a boogie board because a surfboard and a boogie board are attached to your body. They have what's called a leash that the surfboard connects at your ankle or a boogie board maybe at your wrist or sometimes even your ankle. So what happens is when you're catching waves on the the shore of the ocean, uh, if you wipe out, you're attached to a flotation device. So if you wipe out, the surfboard will want to come up to the surface, and so will the boogie board. And so on your body, you'll always feel a tugging when you wipe out because the thing you're holding on to is now floating, or at least attempting to float. When you body surf, you don't have any of those devices because your body is the surfboard. And so the only buoyancy you have is yourself when you're out in the ocean. And so when I would go body surfing, and I still have the equipment in my garage in Seattle. My surf fins and my hand plane. It's called a shotgun. It's a a small little board that attaches to your hand that you use to guide yourself when you're coming in on a wave. But when you wipe out body surfing, there's nothing attached to you that floats. And so you get churned around in the wave and are completely disoriented. All you know is there's lots of sound, there's lots of sand. You might touch the bottom of the ocean, you might not. To be honest, you really don't know which way is up sometimes. And the first couple of times I wiped out pretty bad body surfing, I had a moment of panic because I couldn't figure out which way to swim because I hadn't started to float yet. There's a way to float when you're body surfing. And there's a way to figure out how to get your orientation when you're body surfing. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that later. But I just want you to think for a minute about what it is to be disoriented. We've all had those moments of disorientation, have we not? Whether it may be in the ocean or maybe just in life. When we have different experiences that pull or push on us, that trigger us in different ways, and that are shocking experiences. Sometimes if we've had a car accident, we're disoriented. When somebody gives us a medical diagnosis we didn't expect, we're disoriented. Any of those moments in our life when we have trouble logging where we're at, what's going on, and which way is up are disorienting experiences. Surely one of the most disorienting experiences we have in life is mourning or grieving when we suffer a form of loss. And let's be clear from the outset that the mourning and grieving we're talking about isn't just that which we suffer when someone we know or love deeply has died. Mourning and grieving are triggered oftentimes when any situation or circumstance in our life changes. When we relocate, we lose a job, financial calamity, medical issues that come up. Anything that disorients us or destabilizes us is a moment of mourning and grieving because the way of life as we knew it is gone. 
and there's something new that has to come. There, there's a lot of this disorientation going on within the world in which we live. Whether it's pandemic that continues to disorient all the time, or whether it's the, the social and cultural unrest we face as a nation and as a culture, we live in a disorienting moment. And so even as we come out of pandemic, oftentimes people talk about getting back to normal. Friends, there's no normal to get back to. The ratchet has turned. There's no way to revert back to who we once were as a people and as individuals. Anyone who suffered personal loss can bear witness to this truth. There's no unwinding it, if you will. I sat this last week with many of our staff and had one-on-one conversations with them. And in one conversation with the staff member I was meeting with, we had a moment to talk about the life of this church over the last 12 years. Do you know over the last 12 years, I, standing here today on week number two, am pastor number seven in 12 years? I want that to permeate into you a little bit. Pastor number seven in 12 years. That's a lot of pastors. And to be honest, it's probably not good for any church to have that many pastors in 12 years. So as I come to be with you as a pastor and as one who serves alongside you, I'm keenly aware of how much flux and change and upheaval that this congregation's experienced over the years. And I say all that to you so that you'll note that in coming to you, my intent is to be with you a long time, not a short period of time. And that's not just good for me and my family, but honestly, that's good for you, if you still like me after 45 minutes. This chaos that we live in triggers deep sense of mourning and grief within us. And this passage of scripture from Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, helps us to begin to understand the promise of grieving and mourning. This second beatitude or this statement of blessing by Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Our translation we use in our pew Bible is up on the screen. Happy are people who grieve because they will be made glad. I hope you hear the the promise in this beatitude or this statement of blessing by Jesus. Do you hear it? Jesus is giving us permission to grieve, to mourn, to reckon with what has been lost. Our work is not to skim over it and run past it or to ignore it, but it's to reckon with it. And Jesus' promise is simply this. Blessed are you who mourn. See the verb tense? Present tense. Blessed are people who grieve. And so today we're going to talk about mourning and grieving. And so I'll invite you to bear with me. Because I think God has some truth for us in Scripture that will open us up to the reality of how we're to deal with mourning and grieving in our life, and especially our decision to reckon with it or to address it, acknowledge it, versus just ignoring it. There's a story in the Bible that illustrates our response to grief and mourning in a powerful way. It comes from the book of Ruth, which is in the Jewish scripture we often call the Old Testament. And so I'm going to invite Carol to come, if you would please now, And she's going to read to you a a lengthy passage from the book of Ruth, beginning in chapter 1. And we're going to go all the way down, I think, to verse 18. Oh, my word. If memory serves me right. So let me see here. I want to make sure I got it. Yeah, Ruth 1, 1 to 18. So after that fine disruption, Carol, lead us in the reading of Scripture. You're welcome to follow along on page 333 in the Pew Bible, if you would like to. During the days when the judges ruled, There was a famine in the land. A man with his wife and two sons went from Bethlehem of Judah to dwell in the territory of Moab. The name of that man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem of Judah. 
They entered the territory of Moab and settled there. But Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Then only she was left along with her two sons. They took wives for themselves, Moabite women. The name of the first was Orpah, and the name of the second was Ruth. And they lived there for about ten years. But both of the sons, Malan and Chilion, also died. Only the woman was left without her two children and without her husband. Then she arose along with her daughters-in-law to return from the field of Moab, because while in the territory of Moab she had heard that the Lord had paid attention to his people by providing food for them. She left the place where she had been, and her two daughters-in-law went with her. They went along the road to return to the land of Judah. Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, turn back, each of you, to the household of your mother. May the Lord deal faithfully with you, just as you have done with the dead and with me. May the Lord provide for you so that you may find security, each woman in the household of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. But they replied to her, No, instead we will return with you to your people. Naomi replied, Turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Will there again be sons in my womb that they would be husbands for you? Turn back, my daughters. Go, I am too old for a husband. If I were to say that I have hope, even if I had a husband tonight, and even more, if I were to bear sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you refrain from having a husband? No, my daughters, this is more bitter for me than for you, since the Lord's will has come out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth stayed with her. Naomi said, Look, your sister-in-law is returning to her people and to her gods. Turn back after your sister-in-law. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to abandon you, to turn back from following after you. Wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do this to me, and more so if even death separates me from you. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her about it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a couple of questions I want you to think about as we prepare to talk about this text from Ruth. So I'm going to have our slideshow go back a few slides. There's some questions just to wonder about. And here they are. What mourning have you embraced? And what mourning have you ran away from? What mourning have you embraced? And what mourning have you ran away from? I think it's important for us to be thinking about that kind of mourning, whether we embraced it or ran from it, as we hear the story from Ruth. Now, a little bit about the story. It makes sense. There's a lot of characters and a lot of moving parts. There's a man named Elimelech, and he marries a woman named Naomi. They're from Bethlehem. They have two children, Mahlon and Chilion. And after after they have their two sons, they decide to move from Bethlehem to Moab. Now Moab is straight east. If you're in Bethlehem and you go east, you land in the land of Moab. When they arrive in Moab, the two sons find two Moabite women that each of them will be wives to the two sons. So Orpah and Ruth are the two Moabite women. So you have your family together now, right? You have Elimelech and Naomi, husband and wife, and then you have their two sons, Mahlon and Chilion, with their two wives now, Orpah and Ruth. Well, as soon as everyone's married and everyone's happy and everything is lovely and there's lots of frolicking and joy, Elimelech dies. And then not too long after Elimelech dies, Naomi's husband, 
Both of the other husbands die, Mahlon and Chilion. They both die. So now in Moab, you have three women, Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth. None of them have husbands anymore. None of them have had any more children. And so let me explain a little bit about what that means in the ancient world. This story that we read in Ruth happened, let's just say for the sake of argument, 3,000 years ago. 3,000 years ago, in the ancient Near East, if you were a woman, you had no rights, you had no vote, you were actually the property of either your father or your husband. You were considered chattel. This is a patriarchal world in which women are possessions, not people. It's important for you to grasp that nuance in the story. Because without a father or without a husband, as a woman, you are destitute. And so your aim is to find male covering somewhere. Uncle, brother, someone somewhere, because the capacity for you to provide for yourself is gone. So I share this with you only so you understand that not only are these women dealing with the grief of the death of all of their husbands, but now they're facing a socioeconomic crisis that they have no way to sustain themselves in the ancient world. And so Naomi brings her two daughter-in-laws together and tells them each, you should go back to your mother's home. In other words, go home to your ancestral home because there you'll be provided for. Remember, these are two Moabite women. Naomi is going to go home to where she's from. What city is that, everyone? Bethlehem. So she's going to go home to Bethlehem. She tells her two daughter-in-laws to go home. They tell her no. She says, no, you really have to. And so what ensues in the text that Carol read is a little bit of an argument between Naomi and her two daughters-in-laws. And eventually, Naomi prevails over one of them. Orpah agrees to leave. She weeps and kisses her mother-in-law, and she goes back to her family in Moab, wherever that was. Ruth, on the other hand, does not. Ruth, for whatever reason, decides to stay with Naomi, to leave Moab, where she's from, and return to Bethlehem with Naomi. And in what is probably one of the most lovely passages of scripture in the Bible is this oath that Ruth takes in the midst of her grief and mourning with Naomi. It's in Ruth chapter 1. I'm going to read it, verse 16. It says this. But Ruth said, Do not plead with me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you sleep, I will sleep. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and worse, if anything but death separates me from you. Wow. Great passage of scripture. It's lovely. There are some keys from this text we can take away from it as we learn a little bit about how they handled their mourning and their grief in this moment. The first one is this, is that mourning loves company. Not misery loves company. That's an idiom we have in English, in American culture, no, mourning loves company. So in the midst of all of their grief, Orpah decides to go home because she has company wherever that is. She has, in other words, people who can journey through her mourning and grief with her. But Naomi and Ruth are going to go back to Bethlehem. And so rather than let Naomi go back to Bethlehem alone, Ruth chooses to go with her. You see, the notion of there being companionship in the midst of mourning and grief is the beginning of understanding this promise Jesus is getting at. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So Ruth chooses to stay with Naomi, and Naomi ultimately allows her to stay. Mourning loves company. Another truth from this text that I think we need to hear quite clearly has to do with Ruth's commitment to Naomi. At the end of that text that Carol read, there's this statement. May the Lord do so to me and worse if anything but death separates me from, me from you. That sounds like an oath, doesn't it? Because it is. 
As a matter of fact, Ruth has taken the strongest oath you can possibly take in the Bible. In the way in which she says, Naomi, I'm going with you no matter what. And nothing will separate me from you. So it's not just, hey, I'll bring by a covered dish tomorrow. It's what? I'm going to stay with you through thick and thin no matter what happens. It's a different level of commitment. And the the third key we can take from this story is this. Is that Ruth chooses to share the burden, not just witness the burden. Have you ever been with a person who's suffered some tragedy and had a very difficult time being present with them? Sometimes it might feel a little awkward. It's it's difficult to figure out what to say. It's happened to me. And so oftentimes what we do is in our good intention, we say something that we think is supposed to help or fix or repair what's gone on. And in fact, the very last thing the person needs is any suggestion from us about how to fix it. What we're talking about here is something called the ministry of presence. And we'll talk about it more in just a moment. So here's some questions for us to reflect on as we've heard the story from Ruth. This is a story about loyalty. So when does loyalty matter most? And so there's something hidden in that question, by the way, everyone. Does it Does loyalty matter most when everything's going great? Or does it matter most when the chips are down when we're in crisis? When does loyalty matter most? And then how is loyalty connected to love? That's what makes this story so great about Ruth and Naomi is there's so much love going on in this passage of scripture. I've actually gone to weddings and heard that passage of scripture read at a wedding thinking that it has to do with husbands and wives when in fact it's an exchange between um, a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law. The text is so profound in terms of what it conveys to us about love. It's so rich and meaningful. What is, how is loyalty connected to love? Well, let's talk about how this works in us. First, mourning and grief are gifts from God. Mourning and grief are gifts from God. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. So these things are gifts to us. Because when we suffer loss in any way, whether it's the loss of a a, a significant family member, our spouse, a job, our way of life, whatever it might be, when we suffer loss, we have to have some way of coping with that reality. How do we learn to live life in the absence of that person or that place or that situation? How do we learn to adapt in that space? Mourning and grief are how we adapt and they're gifts from God to us blessed are those who mourn there's a promise that Jesus gives us there's a second way in which this text is alive within us and it is this that community with others matters you heard Ruth's promise to Naomi right to stay in community with her so a lot has been said about how we come out of life in the pandemic And you probably even encountered it this morning. Have you encountered another human being and were uncertain whether you should shake their hand, give them a hug, bump their elbow, bump their fist, or just wave from afar? Has that happened to you? The reality is is that all the social convention about how we engage together as human beings is now eroded. And we're having to relearn that. There's a grieving that comes from the fact that we've all been outside of good community for a long time. We lived in isolation in our homes. We were with only the people who were immediately around us. And for those of you who were single and are single, an even more alienating time being perhaps by yourself. Community is important. The fact that those of you came into this space this morning signifies your commitment to community. Those of you who are watching online and participating in worship online, you too are searching for community probably and how you can connect. Being with other human beings is a good thing, isn't it? You can answer that question. Being with other human beings is a good thing. 
there's no substitute for that. And it's very important for us as a church to remember that we need to have a digital presence, an online presence for our friends and our partners and our members of our church to worship with us. We also need to affirm the truth that being with people in community matters. Just as much as it mattered for Ruth to be with Naomi, it matters to us. Part of how we are healed in the midst of our grieving is by being in community with one another. It's that ministry of presence I talked about a moment ago. The ministry of presence means that you are simply present with a person. So if someone is grieving or hurting, the worst thing we could do is try to fix it. Offer some well-intentioned suggestion. It's simply a matter of being with people. Being with people people. The third key here to this text being alive in us is that communion with God matters most. Communion with God matters most. You're going to hear me say something that I'm going to repeat again and again over the months and years that I hope to be with you. That we worship a God who redeems our pain. We worship a God who redeems our pain. That God leaves none of our pain on the table that we suffer in life. God works to redeem it, to transform us through it. God is actually so good at this work of redeeming our pain, sometimes we mistakenly believe that God sent the pain. And my friends, we are Wesleyan Methodists. God sends no pain to people. Can I be more emphatic? I'm leaning forward. God sends no pain on people. There are different traditions that believe such truth. As Wesleyan Methodists, we reject that notion. But pain happens to us in life and in the living of our days. And in the midst of the pain and the grief and the mourning and the hurt we go through, God meets us there and redeems that pain transforms us, renews us, brings life to us. And so the fourth way this is alive in us, and all of you English teachers out there are going to be so happy, prepositions matter. Prepositions matter. Prepositions are words we use in in the English language and grammar that connect ideas together or talk about the direction in which things happen. Prepositions are words like this, over, over, Under, before, after, with, through, underneath, below. Those are all prepositions. Prepositions matter because was Naomi simply watched by Ruth? Or was Ruth with her? You can answer that question too. Ruth was with her. God is with us. In our pain, in our struggle, and in our mourning. Prepositions matter. God joins people through their mourning and their grief. God joins people in it. So here's some childhood Bible trivia for you. When there was going to be this great flood to flood the entire planet, did God say to Moses, to, to Noah, Noah, I'm going to flood the whole world and destroy it, but I'm going to save you. So I have arranged a 40-day luxurious stay at a resort in Tahiti. And you're going to ride it out on an all-inclusive vacation. You know I'm being ridiculous, right? What did God say to Noah? Build an ark. Ride it out. And I'll be with you. We could go to any character in the Bible... Genesis to Revelation, beginning to end, and I can tell you a story of how that person in that text suffered deep loss and pain. How that person mourned. We could line them up. Noah, Moses, Deborah, Esther. We could line up more. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, David, Solomon. We could go on and on and on with people from the Bible who suffered great loss and God became their companion in the midst of their mourning. And it's through that experience they were transformed. The 
The Presbyterian pastor, Timothy Keller, retired from his church in New York a few years ago, said this. You don't really know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. True? True. So back to body surfing. So when you're body surfing the wave and you get wiped out and arms and legs are flying all over the place underneath that wave and you don't know which way's up, you have to do the most difficult thing there is to do in that moment. And it's to stop swimming. The way you get out of that is to be completely still. Stop moving. Eventually the water will stop churning around in what seems like years is actually just a few seconds. And then you'll slowly begin to feel your body begin to move. And that movement is your body trying to float. And as soon as you feel that motion, you swim in that direction. And soon enough, you arrive at air. When you're getting tossed about in the waves, the only way to ground yourself is to be still. Not to rush to get out of the morning. Not to rush to get out of the pain. How do I fix this? Those are the wrong questions. Perhaps the questions we need to think about are these. Where in your life today do you need to experience the comfort of God in Jesus Christ? Because I'm convinced one of the reasons why people are so angry and embittered and isolated with each other right now in the world in which we live is because they have not reckoned with their mourning. They're like people living in denial of their grief. And so all of their anger, all their frustration, all their resentment is boiling out to other people instead of being directed to the thing in their life that's causing them the deep pain they're experiencing and reckoning with that. So today as we come for communion, I'm going to offer an invitation to you. And the invitation for you as you come for communion today is to spend some moments in prayer. You may want to come kneel here in the front and pray. And what I would invite you to bring today is whatever mourning or grief that's on your heart. It could be something very fresh. Something that's just happened. It could be something that you haven't thought about in a while. Because God doesn't meet you in your grief and your mourning. God is actually already in it. And God is simply waiting for you to deal with it. That's the God who's here today, waiting for you to come and to deal with it. So come this morning for communion. Spend time in prayer, whether you want to kneel in front or in the pew, and just pause for a moment and consider what kind of grief you're holding today. Because there's a God ready for you this morning. Let's pray together.